Uh, thank you, Darren. Good afternoon, everybody. And it is wonderful to be here, God's holy day. So, uh, yeah, so regarding the feast, I really don't have much to say, just a reminder, uh, because I didn't do my due diligence. I didn't get the announcement to Darren. I read the announcement one day this week, and uh, but uh, registration starts on Sunday. If you go to the feast homepage, there'll be the link there to choose your site and to register. It's a totally different system. I've not looked at it yet. I guess it won't be open until Sunday, but uh, so I'm not quite sure what to expect with it. So if you have any problems, you can call me, but I don't know what's going on either, right? I haven't used it yet either. Uh, but hopefully it will be a, a good workflow and easy to get through, and they've done a good job with their user experience of that. Uh, so, yeah, so registration will start the 24th, and then lodging, I think early lodging starts the week after, and uh, maybe a couple of weeks after Sunday that we do the regular lodging. Uh, but one thing at a time for me in my world, uh, registration on Sunday. That's it. That's all I got for the feast. Um, I want to apologize in advance if I have no idea, I got a sermon. I just don't know how the words are going to come out today because we got a new puppy this week and I am so exhausted. And I was thinking about, I was thinking, maybe the words won't come out at all. I was thinking about uh, years ago, there was a, a comic comedian, and it's probably, the video is probably still up on YouTube and some of you have probably seen it, where he's explaining how women will ask their husbands, what are you thinking? And they just, they can't understand how the husband can say nothing. And, uh, and he explained, you know, a man's got all these different boxes up in his head. He's got, the, uh, he's got the food box. That's a big one. He's got the fishing box. He's got the sports box. He's got some a little bit of, he's got a small box called the work box. But he has this big box in the middle called, that has absolutely nothing in it. And he, guys spend a lot of their time in that box. So I get a blank look on my face. As I get tireder, I tend to spend more time in my nothing box. And if I just get a blank, slack-jawed look, and I'm not saying anything, I went to my nothing box. But hopefully uh, we get through the, through the sermon just fine today. All right, well, I want to get started today with a scripture that I don't think I've ever turned to during the days of unleavened bread. But I do think it's a scripture that in many ways is really the origin of why this holy day season even exists in the first place. It's the origin for why the nation of Israel uh, was ever enslaved in Egypt in the first place. The origin for why God had to ransom them away from Pharaoh at that Passover night uh, where the firstborn died in Egypt is the origin of why Jesus Christ some 2,000 years ago came to this earth and to fulfill what that ancient Passover in Egypt could only depict in the shadow of the things to come. The origin, brethren, for why you and I are sitting in this holy convocation today observing a holy day season that is all about the removal of ourselves from sin. It's the origin of us worshiping and observing God on this last day of unleavened bread. And the origin for all of these things resides in what God describes for us in Ezekiel 28. Uh, you know exactly where I'm going when I say Ezekiel 28, a scripture very familiar to many of us, where God gives us a very brief but fascinating glimpse and to things that went on aeons ago. And a fascinating glimpse into the genesis of sin in a universe that he created perfect. You know, without what happened in Ezekiel 28, would you and I even be here today? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the plan was before Ezekiel 28. But I do know that Ezekiel 28 tells us a short story of probably the greatest tragedy to ever befall the universe, to ever befall God's creation. Ezekiel 28, we'll begin in verse 14, where God says, You are the anointed cherub that covers, and I've set you so. You are upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And so God is speaking here of Lucifer, the pinnacle of God's creation. You know, when uh, God gave the instructions to Moses to make that Ark of the Covenant. You have the two angels that spread their wings out over the Ark of the Covenant. And apparently there used to be a third that probably sat there in the middle above those two that had their wings outstretched. And that, that angel was Lucifer, who dwelt there in the presence of God himself, there among the stones of fire in God's holy mountain. And as we know, something went horribly 
terribly wrong with this angel that was perfect and that was holy. It was there in God's holy presence. We read that in verse 15. It says, you were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. Iniquity, the Hebrew word of all. And that word means there is a perversity of spirit. That is not just an action. There is something wrong, twisted in nature with what became of Satan, a moral evil. So it wasn't just a case where Satan made a mistake and sins through weakness. He became perverted in his spirit. It wasn't just that he was doing something that was evil. He wasn't just doing evil. He became evil. It was in his nature. His very nature had become corrupted. And we see the results of that spiritual perversity all in our society today. I mean, all the things that we see, and it's just accelerating at a just a dizzying rate. The perversion of spirit, of the way people think, of the way people's natures operate within them. And our society, it is, it's really frightening to see. And, you know, we see that perversity of spirit playing out on the battlefields in Ukraine right now. And all the atrocities that are going on there, that has always been in man. We've, we've seen these atrocities so sadly committed, repeated time and time and time and time and time again throughout history. Because the nature of man has been twisted. Just like the nature of Lucifer became twisted. We go on here in verse 16. By the multitude of your merchandise, they filled the midst of you with violence, and you have sinned, and therefore I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So here is Lucifer, and God created him holy, and God created him good, and God created him perfect. And then somewhere along the line, something happened up here and in here. And something changed. And he became twisted. And Lucifer then, by his actions and by his nature and his spirit, he profaned that which God had made holy. And the profane thing cannot abide in the presence of God. And so God cast him out. Just like Adam and Eve, when they profaned themselves, they profaned that creation that God had made in them. They profaned that and God cast them out of Eden, just like the, uh, the, the nation of Israel. You know, after they had come out of Egypt, they had been established as a, a, a nation with a national identity, with a monarchy. And God had to cast them away as a stone, he said. And he talks about casting Israel away because they profaned themselves. That which is profane, brethren, cannot dwell in the presence of God. Which presents a problem for every one of us, doesn't it? James 4. James 4. Presents a problem for every one of us because, brethren, somewhere along the way, very early, before we can even remember, before predates our earliest memories, somewhere along the way, we became profane. And we became corrupted. And our very nature, just like Satan and his demons did, just like Adam and Eve became profane. And we have corrupted that which God made good and profaned it, made ourselves profane. James 4, we'll begin in verse, verse 1 here in James 4. James writes, he says, From where to come the wars and the fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust." That war in your members, it's in you, it is part of you. Verse 2, he goes on, he says, You lust and you have not, you kill, desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. So it's the same thing that corrupted Satan in his spirit. It is this lust, it is this envy, these desires that Satan had that did not comport with God's desires for him, that did not comport with God's will for him. The same spirit exactly that we have to deal with because Satan and his demons will cultivate that spirit in us. We are susceptible to that. We all have our desires for the things that war against the will of God. 
we all have our desires to profane those things that God has made good, that God has made pure. We all have to contend with that. We all have our carnal lust that we have to deal with. Well, we go on here in verse 5. James says, Do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lust to envy? And so, just like Satan in his aval, his iniquity, was twisted in spirit, it was inside of him. We all have it inside of us. It's the spirit that dwells inside of us, brethren, becomes corrupted almost immediately. I'm, I believe it's from the time we're in the womb. You can see twins, and they do the uh, ultrasounds or sonograms of the twins in the womb, and they're kicking and biting. I don't even know if they know what they're doing. It starts very early, and we all follow. And the footsteps of sin, not just because we do sin, brethren, but because sin dwells inside of us. Like Paul says, we won't turn there in Romans 7, but Paul says, if I do the things that I don't want to do, it's not me doing it, it's the sin inside of me. It's that nature inside of me. So, brethren, all of us, not just through our actions, but by consequence of who we are, have made ourselves the profane things. As Paul writes in Ephesians 2, we won't turn there either. We've got a lot of scriptures that we'll be turning to, but don't have time for these. But he talks about how we are by nature, by our nature, the children of wrath. By our nature, we follow in the footsteps of the prince of the power of the air. By our nature, left to ourselves, we become just like the rest of the world because it's not just that we do sin, we do evolve. We do iniquity. We do a twisting of our very nature. And so we, at some point, God calls us and he brings us to him and he reveals to us the truth of his holy days and the meaning of those holy days. We come to spring holy days and it doesn't take long keeping these holy days a few times before you start to realize, you know, it's not just about us coming out of the world. It's not just about us coming out of Egypt. The real problem we run into is not disassociating ourselves from the things of the world. The real problem we run into and we figure out real quick is that Egypt isn't just around us. The real problem is Egypt is inside of us. It's inside of us, isn't it? And there's where the real battle lies. After a little while, that's what we all start, all start grappling with. It's something, it's part of who we are and it's not as easy as just leaving a place. It's not as easy as just leaving the bars on a Friday night or leaving whatever it might be. It's not about physically removing yourself from certain environments. That's part of it. It's a big part of it in conversion. But ultimately, it's about that Egypt that is inside of us. And that's the entire problem that the Israelites had. They loved Egypt. And then they go seven, eight, nine hundred years where what was their downfall? Their downfall was the idolatry. They took with them those same idols, those same idolatrous practices that they had become steeped in in the nation of Egypt for hundreds of years. And I find it so ironic. Here we are sitting here today, 3,500 years after the Israelites left Egypt, and how many of these pagan practices do we see mainlined into the Christianity of our churches today that can be traced directly, its roots traced directly to what went on in Egypt 3,500 years ago, still haven't been able to leave Egypt 3,500 years later. Those descendants of Israel. Because they never could leave it behind because it was in them. It was part of their nature. 
And so you and I, we face that same exact problem, the same thing that made Satan profane, the same thing that made Adam and Eve profane, the same thing that made the Israelites profane. Brethren, we all face the same problem, and that is we by sin, we by nature, harbor sin inside of us. The sin we commit is simply a manifestation of the Egypt that's living inside of us. <laughs> the sin we commit is just a symptom of something much deeper in our lives, isn't it? It comes out of the heart, as Jesus Christ says. The things that defile us come out of the heart. Now, here's the thing, and this is what these Days of Unleavened Bread are about. God can take that which is absolutely defiled, that which is complete, completely profane, God can take that and he can make it holy. Last time I spoke about holiness when I gave a sermon. This time I'm going to be speaking about holiness in the context of the Days of Unleavened Bread. In fact, if you'd like a, a title for this sermon, you can call it A Journey to Holiness because God has called us, yes, out of Egypt to make a journey to holiness, but more than that, it is about transforming that which is profane, that which is corrupt, and making it holy. Because God has a way of doing that, and that's wonderful news for every one of us. Let's turn briefly to Exodus 29. There's something pretty interesting here that God states as it pertains to the characteristics of His holiness. In Exodus 29, God has given the instructions for how to construct everything in the tabernacle, and here He's talking to Moses about the, uh, the altar where the various animal sacrifices are going to be given, in particular, uh, in Exodus 29, verse 37. Exodus 29, verse 37. And he says, Seven days you shall make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it. Uh, so this is when they're consecrating all things in the tabernacle to God, giving the instructions for how to do that. It says, Seven days you shall make an atonement for the altar, sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. Now that's interesting to me that they create this altar, which by the way, the altar is just made out of wood and brass, wood altar covered by brass. Nothing remarkable about that wood and that brass, but something happened to it. When it was set apart from God, and God somehow imbued something of himself into that altar, so it became holy as God is holy. It was so holy, in fact, that it wasn't just the altar that was made holy. It was any animal. As soon as an animal touched that altar, God says that animal becomes holy just from touching the altar. Completely now set apart from God, completely purified by God. And to be used exclusively for God. As soon as the animal touched the altar, it now becomes holy. A holy thing to God. So it's not just that God is holy. Anything that God touches becomes holy. Anything that God touched, just like uh, the, the burning bush, that ground around that burning bush, it was holy, it was touched by God. Mount Sinai, God sat atop the, atop the pinnacle of that mountain. The entire mountain became holy because it was in contact with God. When God touches something, when he dwells somewhere, it becomes holy. Isaiah 6, Isaiah 6, a really fascinating passage here. The vision that Isaiah had, the experience that he had absolutely remarkable. God takes Isaiah, who was a profane man of profane lips, and he does something remarkable here with Isaiah. Isaiah is recounting the moment that God first called him to his prophetic ministry. And it's very dramatic, this vision that Isaiah sees. Isaiah 6, and in verse 1, Isaiah writes, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the eternal of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
So you have these angels crying out, not just holy. Holy, holy, holy. You know, anytime you see something repeated three times in the Hebrew, Kodesh, 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 that's imparting to it the greatest magnitude imaginable. Uh, the Holy of Holies was Kodesh, Kodesh. <laughs> that, that, that room in the tabernacle and in the temple, the most holy spot on the face of the planet was Kodesh, Kodesh. And so Isaiah is showing that God is holy in a way that is completely different from all the other holy things that the Bible speaks of. Kodesh, Kodesh, Kodesh. Holy, holy, holy. Its very name is holy. And so God is holy in a way that nothing else is and nothing else can be because God is the source of holiness. He is the source of purity. He is the source of perfection. He's the source of everything. And he is holy. He created everything that exists. And he is the one who will take part of his creation and he will sanctify it to become holiness to him. Which is what he's doing for Isaiah in this incident described here. Verse 4, we go on here. It says, the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. The house was filled with smoke. And then I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Eternal of hosts. And it's so interesting, the few times where human beings have looked upon God and been in the presence of God, so often the writers will record this kind of reaction. This visceral, reflexive response where Isaiah is saying, I am so corrupt. I am so filthy. I am so profane. I'm undone. It is a hopeless situation. I am so profane. I am desolate. It's really remarkable. Um, we cannot understand it until we are actually in that position. But these men who were in the presence of God in his glory, they just record, record the, the, the sense of despair at being a carnal, corrupt, profane human being in the presence of that perfection. There's that vast, vast gulf that exists between what God is morally and what we are. And so here's Isaiah and he sees that and he's just, there's no hope left in him. He just despairs because of how corrupt that he now sees and understands that he is. How profane he really is. You know, and you and I would be the same, by the way. I mean, if we ever are put in that situation, we will have the same response. Because compared to God, we really don't understand how hopeless we are <laughs> and how much we really do have to despair of unless God were to come and do something with our lives. But for the first time here in his life, Isaiah is able to clearly see how completely desolate he is because of his sins, because of that Egypt that is part of him. He doesn't say, I do profane things. He says, I am profane. I have profane lips. I live in the midst of an unclean people. And he just gives up all hope because of it. But God has a way, right? He has a way to set us on this journey to holiness. He has a process by which he can purify us. And he goes on here in verse 6. So then flew one of the seraphims to me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs off of the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and he said, Lo, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. I mean, isn't that, isn't that amazing? Isaiah goes from this 
point to where he had just given up all hope. Woe is me, I'm undone. There's nothing I can do. And God comes into his life and he touches his lips and purifies him. He gives him a new life. And Isaiah's response is to say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to. Whatever you want me to do. Brethren, we are filthy, we are corrupt, but when God touches us, He brings us to Him and He touches us and reaches into our lives, He makes us clean and He has reached down and He has touched you. That's why you're here today. He's touched you to purify you, to change your lives. Now, does he do that because we're so great and we're so worthy? And I think we all know, of course, he doesn't do that because of our worthiness. Do we become holy people because we are so wonderful and so talented and we're so great at putting sin out of our lives? And of course, that's not why we become a holy people. We become a holy people because God is perfect. God is pure. He is the source of holiness and he makes us holy. And when he does that, he asks us to respond to him. Because that which is holy is used for God's purpose, remember? Which is exactly what we see Isaiah doing here. He understands now that God has taken him, purified him. He is set apart now for God's purpose. And he says, send me, I'm here, please. Whatever you want. Isaiah goes from being something that is profane. To being someone who is holy and his response to that is to do the work that God has given him to do. That's his response to that. Isaiah is given this explicit invitation from God to come into the presence of God, to come into the throne room of God. God brings him up into his throne room in a vision. And Isaiah now becomes something completely different from what he was before that exchange. So when we observe the Passover, and we observe these days of unleavened bread, brethren, we begin to understand that God has done all these things that he, that's, that's uh, wrapped up in these days. All the things that are depicted in these days, God does them so he can change us from that which is profane and that which is corrupt into that which is holy. He couldn't do that for Lucifer. At least we don't think he could. There's no indication that he can. He couldn't do that for the demons by all, indication, all indications. I don't know why. I don't know why there's no remedial process for them. But God can do that, brethren, for us to bring you to him, to touch you and purify you of all the things you've done to profane yourself so that now you can be used by him. That's what these days are about. That's what this journey is about. To become his holy children. To be used by him however he wants to use us in the kingdom to come. These days are about that which has been cast out from the presence of God, that which, like Isaiah, is in a hopeless, desolate state. It's about God bringing us back to him now and remaking us in his image, restoring us, creating in us a holy state through the holy covenant that He's made with us. We're made holy, brethren, by God taking us for his own. Things are made holy when God reserves them for his use, like that, that altar in the tabernacle. Places are made holy when God dwells in those places, like the burning bush, like Mount Sinai. 
People are made holy when God takes that person, separates them out for his use, and dwells inside of them. Just like when God came and dwelt in the Holy of Holies. And it was the holiest place on the face of the earth. He dwells in us. But you know, there's a big difference between a little room in a tabernacle or a little room in a temple and a human being. Now, that, that little room had no free moral agency. When God wanted to come and dwell in it, he dwelt in it. It was for his use. Human beings, human beings have free moral agency. God will take us and sanctify us. He will purify us. We have to decide then. We have to decide whether we're going to respond to what he's given to us in a holy fashion. You, know, you think about that holy of holies, that little room there, where if you entered into it, you would die. Either God would kill you or you'd be stoned by the, by the nation, but you would die for entering into that room. That's how holy that place was. That is the reverence with which the people were to treat that small area inside of a tent. That's how important this concept of holiness is to God. People died. Nadab and Abihu, they died for profaning that which was holy. If you remember the story about David when he was bringing the ark back from Obed-Edom and Uzzah died trying to steady the ark in the cart because they were not re revering that ark and respecting the way God had told them to transport it and Uzzah died. They did not revere that which was holy. Brethren, you and I are sitting here in a holy convocation a commended assembly that is holy before God in holy time, a day, a time that God says is holy and he's made it holy. And we are to revere that. We're to revere that. I, I, I don't know if I think enough about that when I come to Sabbath services or a holy day service, this concept of, of holiness and how important it is to God when God says this is a holy place, a holy time, a holy assembly. And it is to be revered. It is to be respected. Now, brethren, you and I have been given a holy calling through a holy covenant. And that is to be revered. Exodus 19. Exodus 19. I mean, these days that we're, we're observing, we've been observing this uh, the past eight days now, including the Passover. It's not about God going into the tabernacle and making this, this tabernacle holy. It's not about God going to a place or going into a tent or an altar or a labor that's used in the sacrificial offerings and making those things holy. It's about how God has brought you to him out of all the world. He elected to bring us before him into his presence to make us holy. And we should revere that. God has brought us out of this world and brought us to him so that he can touch us. And transform us. So that he can not dwell in a tabernacle made out of badger skins and ram skins. But dwell in us. Exodus 19. Exodus 19 verse 4. God tells us, he says, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings, and I brought you unto myself. So just like God brought the physical people of Israel to him there at Mount Sinai, he has brought us 
to him, brethren. And God, remember, has gone through a little bit of trouble to do that, hasn't he? Now, 3,500 years ago, God destroyed a nation to ransom his people of Israel out of a na the nation of Egypt. Destroyed that nation. Took the lives of all the firstborn. For you and me, brethren, 2,000 years ago or so, he sent his only son to this earth to die an excruciating sacrifice for you and me so that he can bring us into his presence and work with us. Jesus Christ was broken. He was abused. His body was ripped to a bloody pulp. And he was hung up on the crucifixion, brethren, so that God could bring us to him and make us holy. That's what we're doing here today. That's what we're doing with our lives. It's what God is doing with our lives. And this time of the year, we remember how important it was to God and Jesus Christ to make us holy. That's how important our holiness is. That brutal sacrifice that they're willing to go through for us because God wants to make us holy the way that he's holy Jesus Christ had to die in order to take that which is profane and to remake it now into the image of God to set us upon this journey to holiness that we go through for our entire lives now now, holiness is something so serious that God pays with it with life. He pays with it, with life. And so he's done all of that now to bring us to him, to separate us to him, and to make us holy for him. We go on here in verse 5, here in Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. If you will obey me and keep my covenant. Here I am, God, whatever you want me to do. The response, right? God brings us to him. And now he's looking for that response. Verse 6, he says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the to the children of Israel. So he is making them a holy nation and God's telling them, I've done the work now of ransoming you. I paid the price for ransoming you through that Passover sacrifice. And now I've brought you to me and now it's up to you to decide. I'm giving you the words of life here. I'm giving you the ways of life. It's up to you to decide now. Will you obey this covenant or not? I guess it was uh, about a year ago, right? No, two years ago. And uh, I guess it was the holy day season, spring holidays. The rights that God has given to us, and all those rights flow through the covenant. It all comes through the covenant. He's drawn us to him to make him holy, but it goes through the covenant to do that. And so now every bit of it is predicated, brethren, upon how we decide we're going to respond to that which God has given us when he purified us. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. I, I find it really interesting. Much like, like faith, holiness is in the doing for us. I mean, we can't make ourselves holy. Please, uh, let me make that abundantly clear. Eh, there's nothing we can do to purify ourselves after we've profaned ourselves. But God is telling the Israelites and he's telling us, if you want to be a holy people to me, it goes through this covenant. What are you going to do? How will you obey? It's in the doing. It's in the action. And in Hebrews 12, God poses that question to us very directly. How will we respond now that he's called us to him? So Hebrews 12, we'll start in verse 18. God says, for you are not come to the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure. 
that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it would be stoned or thrust through with the dart. So we're not called to this physical mountain of Mount Sinai, which, by the way, was so holy that if a hand crossed the line, God said, you put them to death. You have a goat wandered up on the base of the mountain. You put the goat to death. That's how holy that physical mountain was with a physical covenant that had physical blessings. If that physical mountain of Mount Sinai was so holy that anything that approached it was destroyed, and brethren, what kind of reverence should you and I have for this holy covenant that God has called us to? This calling, this journey that he set us upon. When we go on, let's drop down to verse 22 here. He says, but you are come unto Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. We started out with spirits that God made good, and he made pure. We corrupted those spirits. We profane those spirits because, again, Egypt is just not something that's just around us. Egypt is something that is who we are. It's part of our carnal spirit. It's ingrained into our natures. We started out on this journey with spirits that are corrupted, and God has brought us to him now to change those spirits and to make us perfect to make the spirits of just men made perfect I love that phraseology in the King James these days brethren are about how God has called us to him to perfect us and he can do it and we can do it as part of the faith of the Passover, that God really can live in us and dwell in us to make us perfect, to deliver us from all of our corruption. So God is perfecting us, and how does he do it? Well, verse 24, it says, To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. He perfects us through that new covenant, that covenant that he's made with us, brethren, that he's called us to, and we must not refuse that. As the writer says in verse 23, we must not refuse that, but rather serve God in an acceptable manner, which does involve reverence, which does involve godly fear, because, again, God is holy, holy, holy. He's different. He's different from everything else in our lives. Our calling is different from everything else in our lives. This word is different from everything else in our lives. And it demands our profound respect because of that. And neither we revere this calling out of Egypt that God has given to us for the holy calling that it is, and either we revere this covenant with God in Jesus Christ for the holy covenant that it is, for the holy marriage relationship, that God wants to marry us. The deepest, most profound relationship you could have with somebody. Either we treat that with the reverence for the holiness that it is, or it just becomes another part of our lives. Something that we do on the weekends. Something that isn't really all that special. Something that is common. Something that is profane. Something that we take for granted because God will always be there. The calling will always be there. The covenant will always be there. Until one day it's not.
Not if we profane it. John 6. John 6, brethren, we're faced with the challenge of having to change our very nature. Having to change the moral evil, the twisted, the perversity that resides within our spirit. But we can't do that on our own. Okay? Let's make no mistake. God doesn't expect us to do any of this on our own. That's the good news for us. The only way we can do it is through the covenant relationship that we get to keep with God. We get to keep it with God. All this transformation into holiness, it only happens through the covenant that God in his mercy, in his love, in his unmerited favor, his graciousness to us, he's given us the means by which we can become perfect in spirit. He has the means of doing that. John 6, we'll start in verse 53 here. Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And so this sounded really strange to the Jewish people he was talking to, and that would sound strange to anybody who didn't understand the context of where he was coming from. But unless we come to this Passover sacrifice that Christ has given to us, we come to this covenant relationship that God has made with us, unless we do that, we all be dead men. What the Egyptians said, the night of the Passover, and all the firstborn had died, and they said, you know what, we're all going to die. We don't let these Israelites leave. We all be dead men, brethren, because that's what Egypt does. It kills us all. It kills us all. The only way that God can redeem us from all of that it's not just about taking us out of Egypt, but it's about taking Egypt out of us. And here Jesus Christ in John 6 is getting into the heart of that, right? I mean, that's the hard part about these days. It's where we understand that the holiness of what it is God has called us to, brethren, so that we can revere everything about this calling. But the hard part is about how do we get there to remove that which is inside of us. And Jesus Christ is telling us here in John 6, the first thing you have to do is come under that sacrifice. The first thing you have to do is to come to that covenant and be willing to keep it, to really commit ourselves to keeping. It's a covenant of sacrifice. God sacrificed for us, we become holy sacrifices for him. And just like we eat our daily bread, we have to partake of Jesus Christ. And we have to partake of the Word because Christ was the embodiment of the Word of God. Just like we're eating and drinking each day. That's how integral a part of our lives this relationship with God has to be. Now, if we live with God each day, if we are ingesting Jesus Christ each day, God will transform us. We're not going to overcome sin. I hope none of us are confused about that. You and I aren't going to do it. We have our part in it. We have our honest, sincere effort. Let's keep these days with sincerity and truth. But it's not you and me, our power that's going to overcome sin. And we all know that. If you want to overcome sin... You partake of Jesus Christ. You partake of this word the way we would our food and our drink. Because we become what we eat. What are we eating spiritually each day? What's our spiritual diet? Because God, Jesus Christ is telling us, you get the right spiritual diet, this will work. This will work. Verse 54. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, 
and I in him. And brethren, that is the key to coming out of sin. No, that is the key to getting sin out of us. It's when Jesus Christ becomes a part of who we are. Just like sin was a part of who we are, the only way to get it out is to put God in. The only way to remove that corrupted nature, to remove that iniquity, that of all, is to replace it with the indwelling of God in Jesus Christ. And we have to live, eat, and breathe this covenant with God, this relationship with God to do it. Jesus Christ has to become a part of who we are. God the Father has to become a part of who we are. And that only happens when we make our home with them. When we're with them all the time. So there's a reason for why God likens this covenant relationship to the food we eat and the beverages we drink because that is how critical, that is how much a part of our lives. This covenant, it sustains us. God and Jesus Christ renew us. They sustain us because our walk with God has to become just as much a part of our daily lives as eating and drinking is. That's the bottom line. And if we can do that, then God will certainly respond to us. And that's how you come out of sin. That's how you put the Egypt out of you. It's the only way I know of. It's the only way I see written in here. I don't know of any other way. That's why for me, ultimately, <clears throat> the Days of Unleavened Bread sermons are usually pretty simple. Every sermon I give, I'm a simple man, I guess. But there's only one way to put the sin out, and it ain't us. It is not us. Only God, brethren, can transform who and what we are in our spirit. Only God can do that. But he tells us, he will only elect to do that if we are responding to this covenant. And that Holy of Holies, which was treated with such reverence, such fearful respect by all the people of Israel, that was just a symbol of how God would come to you and make his covenant with you so that he could dwell inside of you. And if that Holy of Holies was so sacred, brethren, how sacred is this calling that God's given to us to make us his dwelling place. All the things that we do during this season about us coming under the sacrifice of Jesus Christ so we can be redeemed from all of our profanity, about us entering into this covenant that only comes through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, about observing these days that are about us in God, really, putting out sin, all of that, brethren, is about God drawing us to him and us responding to him. After he's had mercy upon us. And if we respond to him. Then God will dwell inside of us. He will. He will. He's faithful. And if God dwells inside of us. He will give us his spirit. To transform our nature. Romans 8. Romans 8, we do not get out of Egypt on our own because we cannot change the things that live inside of us on our own. We need God to tra transform us by dwelling inside of us. So Romans 8 in verse 1. 
Paul writes, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So it is our walk now. It is our way of life now. It is the way, it is our nature now. It's the way we do things. If we're truly partaking of the Passover every day, brethren, partaking of this covenant every day, it becomes our way of life now. Walking after the things of the spirit. We go on uh, dropping down to verse four, verse four, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So again, what are we minding now? What are we minding? What's our spiritual diet like? What are the things that we are bringing in to our spirit each day? Because God in Christ is saying, listen, we are willing to come and infuse you with our presence. Just come to us. Respond to us. We'll do it. We'll do it. He's given us that opportunity. We'll drop down here in verse 9 of Romans 8. Verse 9 says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the flesh is corrupt. The flesh is profane. God is telling us, brethren, that he will come and dwell inside of us, make us holy to him, purify us to make us spiritual, to make us something new. New creations. Coming up out of our baptismal graves. Verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised Jesus from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. And to me, that is the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity, it ain't easy. It's the hardest thing we'll ever do. Hardest thing we'll ever do, changing this nature inside of us. Uh, the hardest thing we'll ever be a part of, I should say. It's God working in us that changes that. But God, through his Holy Spirit, it all comes down to that. The things we're trying to accomplish in these days. So, many aeons ago, there was a perfect being who became corrupt and who introduced sin into the universe. You know, the, the whole universe was holy at that point. Prior to sin, the whole universe was holy. Everything was made by God. Everything was made for God, set apart for God. Everything was pure. Everything was perfect. A universe, an entire universe that was holy. And then Lucifer profaned that. And he profaned himself. And he profaned a lot of other angels as well. And he became morally perverted. In his very nature, he became perverted. He profaned that which was holy, and they cannot be redeemed now. But you and I can be. You and I are redeemed. And unlike Lucifer, God has brought us back from that and brought us to him and not just touched us, to make us holy, but to dwell in us, to dwell in us, to make us holy. Not just to bring you out of Egypt, not just to bring you out of the things you were doing in the world around you, but to remove Egypt from inside of us. To completely renew us. First Peter 2. First Peter 2. And God has given to us this most loving of all sacrifices he could have possibly given to remo remove that nature, that corrupt nature from inside of us. And he's given to us, brethren, this covenant to do that. And that sacrifice and this covenant and this calling are holy, and we are to revere that. We are to revere what God has sacrificed for us. We are to revere the fact that our lives are now the holy dwelling place of God. Because if we don't revere that, 
then we're just going to keep profaning it all over and over and over again. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And that phrase, show forth the praises of him, in the old King James can be translated to show the virtues of God. We are to show the virtues of God himself to the world around us. When people interact with you they interact with me they should see the virtues of god in us because god is dwelling in us that's what we've been called for it's the amazing opportunity that only happens though brethren when we are eating the bread of jesus christ every day when we're living and walking this way of life with god dwelling inside of us well verse 10 which in time past were not a people but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. There was a time when we were like Isaiah, there before the throne of God, when we were nothing. And we were desolate, and we were hopeless, because we had thrown all of it away in our sins. I mean, the difference for us was, there was a time where we didn't even realize that. Isaiah comes before the throne, he understands We were just nothing. God has had mercy upon us. We weren't a people. But now we are the people who belong to God. Almost 8 billion people upon the planet. We belong to God. What a rare gift. What a precious gift. A holy people called for his holy purpose. Into his holy covenant. The holiness, brethren, for us is in the doing. The holiness is in how we respond and how we revere all of that. Almost 8 billion people on the planet in what God has given to us. We should revere that. We should make it mean something in our lives when God says, You were not a people, but now you are a holy people to me. We should revere that. And the way that God works with each one of us as he takes us on that journey from where we all started as these profane things that had to be cast away from the presence of God and he takes us on that journey to holiness where we will be his people. And out of all the earth, brethren, God will make us the holy dwelling place for God himself.